بسم الله والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا حبيبنا نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome back to another production of Raddu Shubuhat Today we want to look at the dilemma of forgiveness of God according to the Christians The Christians believe that God is ever just and Christians also believe that God is ever merciful. But their strange view of both qualities put them into a quagmire as they believe that God wants every sin to be punished as seen in the book of Hebrews in chapter 9 verses 22. It says, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. While at the same time, the mercy of God should be able to cover any impoverished servant. As can be understood from the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 17. It states, From that time on, Jesus himself began to preach, Repent for the kingdom of God. Of heaven has come near. One, the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 4.17, while the other teaching is from Paul in Hebrews 9.22. So how does the perfect justice of God and the perfect mercy of God become a reality in God? If the perfect justice of God is executed, that means that every single sin has to be punished without fail. But if this is the case, then this deprives God of pure mercy as he is forced to punish every single sin. And if the perfect mercy of God prevails, then this demands that God shows mercy to those who sin, thus not punishing all the sins committed and causing God to fail in his justice. So the Christians believe they have solved this problem by creating the narrative of Jesus dying on the cross for the sins of humanity as a ransom. Thus, in the sacrifice of Jesus, every sin was placed upon his back and was punished by his death. And the very act itself was an example of God's mercy, thus solving the dilemma of the perfect justice of God meeting the perfect mercy of God. But this narrative creates another problem. But before we explain what this problem is, let us backtrack and look at a core Christian belief and see, in fact, is it? in and of itself consistent with the justice of God or the mercy of God or neither. The Christians believe in what is called the original sin. Original sin is a concept or the idea that the first man Adam and his wife Eve committed a sin in the garden and because of that sin every man and every woman that came into existence thereafter came into existence with the stain of sin on them. Thus establishing the idea that everyone is born into this world as an inherent sinner. You are born a sinner irrespective of the fact that you have done nothing to warrant being called a sinner and have done nothing to warrant the divine displeasure of God Almighty. So an innocent baby is born a sinner as they grow up. They grow up as a sinner. As they reach the level of manhood or womanhood, they reach it as a sinner. And when they die, unless they believe in Jesus, according to the Christian faith, they die as a sinner. Now let us examine the concept of original sin. If we consider the divine justice, is it just for one to be labeled and stigmatized and condemned to the displeasure of God because of an act that was done thousands and thousands of years prior? the individual by someone else? Would one consider that to be just? Can we truly assert that the justice of God is prevailing over the idea of original sin? Then we have to look at the mercy, the divine mercy of God as related to this concept. We have an infant that's born and born in sin. It may be 
that in the will of God, the child is destined to die at the age of 1, 2, 5, 10, or 15 even. A young death, before the to grow up to really explore the world. So this 1-year-old, 2-year-old, 5-year-old, 6-year-old is taken back to God before they're able to actually understand the true nature of God and the true purpose of life. But according to Christian theology, because this person was born a sinner and he died before confessing the belief in Jesus as they understand it, this person is damned to hell. We have to ask in the light of the divine mercy of God Almighty, is this merciful? Is it just that a person is born in such a state without doing anything to warrant such a stigmatization? And is it merciful for that person to now be punished for a crime that they never committed? This is the Christian belief and this is their dilemma. Now, the Christians believe that the only way for this original sin to be removed forever was for God himself to come incarnate in a form of a man and empty himself and humble himself from his authoritative position as God to become a servant, one that would encounter enemies, inevitably forced to run for his life, and ultimately being pinned to a cross or tree to die a disgraceful death. This is a Christian belief of salvation before God. Ironically, when we examine this a bit further, we find that it was God the Father who commissioned a seemingly unwilling son, as we read in the Bible in Matthew 26, 39, as it states, Going a little further, he fell his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it be possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Unwilling son, as we read in the Bible, Matthew 26, 39, to come and die and bear the sins of humanity, to become cursed, all for the reason of God to exhibit mercy upon his servants. So, instead of simply exhibiting mercy, as is a great quality of God, rather God had to be tempered by his justice and forced to send his innocent son to die for humanity because of a sin that was committed by Adam and Eve. Here we have to ask, is it just that a father, supposedly loving father who wants the best for his servants to send his son, an innocent one to be killed for the sins of humanity, who only bear the burden of sin because of a concept that they inherited due to an action that their forefathers forefather had done thousands of years prior? Is this just? For God to even conjure up the narrative to send an innocent man to die for humanity is against the ancient teachings of the scriptures in the first place, as we read in Ezekiel 18, 20-22. It reads, and starting at verse 20, The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. But if a wicked person turns away from all the sins they have committed, and keeps all my decrees, and does what is just and right, that person will surely live. They will not die. None of the offenses they have committed will be remembered against them because of the righteous things they have done. They will live. Moreover, in the thongs of suffering and anxiety, Jesus repeatedly and sorrowfully and earnestly prayed to God to be saved from the pending fate of apprehension and death by his persecutors, all the while for his prayers to fall in vanity and void of acknowledgement by God. Where is the mercy of God in such a dealing with his own son? Where is the mercy of God in dealing with his own creation? For one who have not even reached the age of discernment to know who God is, and to not know now why he will be punished eternally. The Christians believe that this death on the cross 
this alleged death on the cross was where justice meant mercy. And because of this, this allowed for God to exhibit his complete justice by putting all the sins of humanity on the back of Jesus and have him executed while expressing his divine mercy by devising the narrative of sending his son in order to pay the ransom. This is the Christian belief as related to God and his justice and his mercy. Now, let's closely examine the dilemma that we have here, and that is the dilemma of forgiveness. Given the fact and ideology of Christians that every single sin must be punished, and that God cannot forgive and have mercy upon his subjects if he so will, although this is contrary to the teachings in the Old Testament, as found in 2 Chronicles 7.14, Isaiah 55.7, and many other places. Yet, we are met with the reality that the Christians have forced their God to become one who has no power to forgive, because every single sin must be punished as we read in Hebrews 9.22. How can every sin be required to be punished and at the same time God forgives sin? Although the Bible tells us that God is forgiving and that God loves to forgive, as we have just shown, still yet, what the Christians have done to their God is deprived Him of ever being able to forgive any sin ever again. What type of God is one that can't forgive if he so pleases? Is that somehow not being God? Is that not what the essence of forgiveness is all about? Realizing that one deserves to be punished, yet forgive them? Isn't this the essence of displaying one's true mercy and magnificence? The Christians have lost this concept on the idea of original sin. And because of it, they have destroyed the true mercy and forgiveness of God. If the Christians will say no, God can forgive, one just have to confess. No matter how much they try to convince themselves of this lie, with the death on the cross narrative, the Christians have eternally imposed upon God the inability to forgive. In the closing, let us clarify. If one believes that Jesus died for their sins, then every sin they committed is supposed to be covered in the blood of Jesus meaning that Jesus paid the price for your sin. But if Jesus paid the price for your sin because every sin must be punished, then where is the forgiveness? Even in your belief in Jesus. Because God didn't forgive, God executed what he desired from punishing Jesus. He took the ransom. An example to close this matter is that someone owes an individual a large amount of money let's say one million dollars and that person cannot pay at the time they agreed to pay so the one who loaned the money began to demand the payment and the one who borrowed the money because of their condition could not pay so an arbitrator came in and decided to take upon himself the debt and paid it the one who loaned the money in the first place accepted the payment of the debt and freed the individual of the responsibility thereof. In this example, would this be considered to be forgiveness? Did the one who loaned the money forgive the one who owed the money? Not at all. No forgiveness whatsoever took place. Rather, the one who loaned the money sought 100% of what was owed to him and didn't care who or what paid it. The bottom line is that it was paid for. Would one call the loner merciful and forgiving? Not at all. So how can Christians attribute mercy and forgiveness to God when their faith says every single sin has to be punished? And if they say that God is so merciful that he gave his son as quoted in the Bible, then is this true mercy? Is it really merciful to put your son in a line of fire and to be killed for the sins of humanity to show your love for humanity? Is this the way to show the love of God? By sending an unwilling man, as understood from the Bible, to come and die a painful and disgraceful death on the cross? Would any parent consider that to be kind and merciful behavior? 
If a father had a son and he seen someone outside getting ready to incur impending danger and as a gesture of mercy and compassion he went and he took his young son with him and threw his son in harm's way to be killed instead of the person that was initially there. Would we call that father merciful? Would we call that father loving to his son? Not at all. So why would we try to call the Heavenly Father, according to Christian belief, merciful and kind for throwing his son in harm's way, supposedly for the sins of humanity? No, this is not mercy, nor is this even logical, nor is it just, and nor can we ever derive forgiveness from it. In all honesty, it is quite ridiculous. And this is what the Christians believe and have to offer us. We say, no thanks. We submit to the one true God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who although detest sins, have the unlimited capacity and will to forgive whoever he so wills, with no compromise in any of his divine attributes. As it is inscribed on his majestic throne, my mercy supersedes my wrath. This is what we want to present. Hada wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. Subhanaka lahum wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ila al ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu alaykum. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.